Welcome everybody to the JVS Vascular Science webinar. Uh, this uh, webinar, uh, we have a topic of aneurysms and uh, will be moderated by our associate editor, Dr. Jose Diaz. Uh, before we begin though, I'm gonna ask our uh, assistant editor, Dr. Paul DiMuzio to introduce the ground rules of the webinar. Dr. DiMuzio. Thank you, Alan. I hope you can hear me. Privileged to help out today. Just wanted to ask everybody to stay muted during the presentations. And as the presentations move along, if you have any questions or comments, please post to the, to the chat so that our moderators can pick them up and uh, pose the uh, questions. Um, we've started the recording, um, so please be aware of that. Um, it'll also be published later on, so those who have missed it can also view the recording. And lastly, just in the future, please look out for uh, other free uh, journal vascular surgery, vascular science webinars. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Alan, and uh, great to be here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Glovitsky to give a little word of welcome, please. Dr. Glovitsky, our JVS Editor-in-Chief. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. We have an amazing program, truly international, with a great lecture. We are excited that uh, uh, JVSVS organizes this seminar and we are excited to have JVSVS as the fourth uh, journal of the JVS family. So uh, uh, let's go on, uh, Alan, and uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, first, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Jose Diaz, our associate editor, who uh, is a uh, vascular surgeon scientist uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, known for his work for animal models and in venous disease especially. Uh, he helps run the American Venus Forum Day of Science and is well known to be a real innovative researcher. And he's our host for today, Dr. Diaz. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, today we have a very interesting program. Um, you will see a commonality of, uh, that we will develop um, this program thinking in, in AAA, but pointed point out that it will be uh, based on modeling, which uh, it will come on each of these uh, talks. The first talk, the title is patient-specific computational flow modeling for assessing hemodynamic changes following fenestrated endovascular aneurysm repair. And um, it will be presented by Dr. Tran, which is currently a fifth year resident in integrated vascular surgery at Stanford University. He's currently conducting research under um, NIH T32 training grant um, in the labs of Dr. Lee and Martin. Prior to the medical training, he was a biomedical engineer with experience in medical imaging. His research interests involve application of computational fluids dynamics modeling methods to investigate hemodynamics after complex endovascular aneurysm repair. Dr. Tran, take it away. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Diaz, and for the JVSVS editorial board for reviewing and publishing our manuscript and also uh, allowing us the privilege to highlight our work in this webinar. Um, first, just a, a bit of background. Computational studies in general have become much faster and, and cheaper to perform as uh, computational efficiency has really grown on a logarithmic scale over the past several decades. And I like to use Formula One racing as a nice real world example of uh, how CFD can be applied to, to a real world setting where CFD studies have largely replaced traditional expensive wind tunnel testing for improving racing car performance. And they actually spend millions of dollars per year uh, in their annual budgets for this. And a nice uh, visual example is the introduction of a component in the front wing called a cascade deflector. And you can see here based on CFD studies, how 
uh, a cascade deflect results in greatly reduced aerodynamic drag over the front wheels uh, compared to those without the cascade. And that led us to think, you know, how we can how can we apply similar methods to complex EVAR, which often results in large changes in aortic geometry shown here. Uh, this is an example, as, as everyone I think in this talk is aware, fenestrated EVAR with a flared renal graft. But uh, we still are really in the infancy of understanding how these structural changes can influence either branch perfusion or downstream hemodynamics. So our study objectives were to develop a computational flow simulation or CFS pipeline for evaluating hemodynamic changes uh, after fenestrated EVAR. And to do this in the context of a pilot study of 10 retrospectively selected at our institution, uh, patients treated with juxtarenal AAAs uh, with the Cook ZFEN device. And just a brief overview of our overall computational framework. Uh, we use an open source platform called SimVascular, which was a homespun uh, developed program at the Stanford Computational Biomechanics Lab by one of my mentors, Dr. Marsden. Uh, we take uh, clinical data, including pre and post-op CTAs, uh, patient hemodynamics, body surface area, and use those to create uh, tailored patient-specific uh, inflow and outflow uh, waveform conditions. Uh, we then use these to generate uh, flow simulations where we can derive relevant hemodynamic parameters and also visualize uh, flow in 3D. Uh, our specific uh, pipeline is uh, not particularly unique to our study, but uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, are able to model the renal flares, we first create paths down the aorta and its branches. Uh, we then uh, manually segment 2D contours along the path. These are then lofted into 3D models, and then we use a multi-scale uh, finite element mesh uh, with finer mesh in areas of uh, region of interest, such as the branch and the paravisceral aorta here. Uh, for boundary conditions, we use a scaled, uh, allometrically scaled, the patient body surface area, uh, pulsatile inflow waveform. This has been previously validated by prior studies in patients with infrarenal AAAs uh, based on a 4D MRI. Uh, outlet boundary conditions are then tuned to match the uh, patient's blood pressure and compliance. Uh, we then perform pulsatile, non-compressible, rigid wall uh, flow simulations using their built-in uh, Navier-Stokes equation solver. Uh, for this particular study, uh, we evaluated 10 patients uh, treated with the Cook ZFEN device, and we took care to uh, select patients with a variety of graph diameters, as well as uh, a variety of inferior uh, neck angulation. And uh, this is just an overview of all the patients that we modeled in our study. And then I'll, we'll just pick one kind of representative patient. Uh, this is a patient with a six centimeter annuals with a very highly angulated inferior neck. Uh, so we were interested in this patient that had a relatively small diameter graph, 24 millimeters uh, placed here, uh, that had significant protrusion in the renal flares, as you can see in the top right corner, and also highlighted here, and how these geometric changes uh, influence branch hemodynamics. Uh, so for this particular patient, uh, we saw an increase in both uh, pressure, which is uh, represented in the blue lines here, uh, solid lines represent the post-operative state and the dotted lines, the pre-operative state. Um, so both in the proximal and the distal uh, aorta, we saw an increase in uh, aortic pressure and also flow rate distally. For the mesenteric perfusion, uh, this patient did have a significant decrease in celiac and SMA perfusion pressure. And uh, interestingly, uh, we kind of hypothesized that you know, adding in significant renal flares, especially in a 24 millimeter graph would decrease renal perfusion, but actually in this patient, because of the angulation change, uh, it looked like the renal artery pressure and flow rates uh, increased postoperatively on both sides. Uh, in aggregate, uh, we didn't find uh, any uh, large changes in uh, branch pressure between patients, but we did observe small statistically significant differences when you uh, conducted paired analysis for proximal aortic pressure, renal pressure, and renal flow rates. But again, I think uh, the importance of the CFS studies are emphasizing per patient changes uh, that may not you know, uh, uh, 
represent like an average change across everybody. But if you have a specific patient geometry, uh, the CFD can, can really reveal uh, quite significant branch uh, changes after repair. Uh, we also uh, visualize wall shear stress in the branches. Uh, here are uh, wall shear stress contour maps with red areas showing supraphysiologic wall shear stress and blue areas uh, uh, in the branches showing subphysiologic wall shear stress. And really we saw uh, very variable changes, especially in the renal artery branches. In this example, you can see that postoperatively there was uh, improved areas where there was less areas of supraphysiologic shear stress. Uh, this patient seemed to have higher wall shear stress postoperatively, and this patient didn't really have any change. Uh, and again, uh, because those differences were so variable, we did not see any aggregate changes in branch wall shear stress uh, when looking at these uh, values on paired analysis. Uh, next, uh, we performed a 2D visualization of uh, pulse cell flow. Um, and this is the same as the example patient where you can see a relatively small aortic lumen with uh, large uh, uh, protruding renal flares. And you can see here in this, in this uh, highlighted area at the white box, uh, there's significant flow disturbance uh, with lower velocity magnitude than you see in the preoperative state. And again, the same patient, uh, this is now showing vorticity or particle spin. Uh, you can imagine it as a red blood cell uh, rotational forces. Uh, and during the uh, cardiac cycle, you can see just inferior to the renal flares, there's this large area of red, which indicates a higher uh, uh, red blood cell uh, uh, spin associated with the renal flares. And in general, these values are more indicative of turbulent flow as opposed to laminar flow, as you can see above the, the uh, renal arteries here. So in conclusion, uh, CFD provides computational evidence supporting differentiated EVAR with no uh, aggregate adverse uh, renal visceral hemodynamics following graft placement. Uh, there does appear to be a small increase in peak renal artery perfusion postoperatively, at least in the context of our pilot study. And uh, CFD modeling is also a very powerful tool for assessing hemodynamic performance at a patient-specific level. And I'll just end here um, just in terms of uh, uh, going back to the first analogy where F1 cars have really uh, developed over the years and have become faster. And as they've become faster, the flow patterns are a lot more intricate. And kind of likewise, as we progress from standard bifurcated devices to four vessel fenestrated devices to multi-branch and off the shelf devices, uh, human dynamics are bound to become more complex. And uh, I hope that uh, these kind of computational methods can elucidate and increase our understanding of, of, of flow changes after complex EVAR and hopefully uh, one day be used to optimize graph design on a patient specific level. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Allison Marsden and Jason Lee for their ongoing support and happy to take any, any questions. Thank you very much, Ken. I, great imaging. I, I enjoy a lot your presentation. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions. Um, I will go with the first one. Uh, previous studies using um, this computational flow simulation methods are extremely um, limited to a small sample size, less than 10. Uh, how much computational um, time does each simulation take is, uh, is the question for the first one. And if you uh, envision patient-specific CDF models being developed in real time in a clinical setting. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, so uh, we have fortunately have access to very high speed uh, computational clusters at our university and they take somewhere in the six to eight hour range per simulation. And that would need to be done on the preoperative anatomy and the postoperative anatomy. So not really something that can be done in real time, but certainly as these methods progress and the and processing power increases, I think one day we'll be able to reach a state where you can potentially see a patient in clinic and then you know that evening run some studies uh, before tailoring their graph design. That would be the hope. That, that is very interesting. Let me read another question to you, uh, Alan. Do, you, uh, do we have time? 
yeah, we are okay with time, right? All right, so can these studies can be constructed solely uh, with non-invasive data such as uh, CTA or, or is invasive data such as uh, arterial blood pressure required? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that question? I, I missed the first part. So this type of studies can be constructed solely with non-invasive data such as CTA? Yes, it, the, the anatomy can be, can be segmented with CTA. For the inflow waveforms, uh, the, the validated studies, you use something called 4D MRI. Uh, that basically, like kind of like an MRI, you can derive time of flight data uh, and, and visualize an inflow and outflow velocity waveform. Uh, those studies are, are expensive and not routinely done clinically. So we didn't really use those and they weren't accessible for our study. I think the general framework would be, you know, as uh, these studies gain more traction as you do a larger scale validated study with 40 MRI and then kind of fine tune your, your ability to, to create um, accurate physiologic waveform from from CTAs and uh, perhaps an echo or duplex imaging um, that aren't quite as expensive as MRIs. I see. Um, interesting question also here. Um, how do you compare computational models? Uh, I mean, what is happening in real life? Uh, are, um, or what, what, what are the ways to validate the computational models? I think this is the summary for the question. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple of different ways that people validate their models. Um, one again is the 4D MRI, but that one, uh, you can't really drive pressure. So uh, the next way to do it would be invasive studies, either uh, most likely would have to be done during an operation where you put a small, you know, uh, uh, three French, four French catheter uh, to measure pressure in the aorta and its branches. And then you can use that data uh, retrospectively to either tune your boundary conditions um, uh, or and, and potentially use that to create uh, post-operative uh, you know simulation data but I, I think it would be hard to to subject a patient to that pre-operatively just to get relevant pressure and and uh, and and velocity waveforms so still kind of trying to figure out what the best way to implement that that um, intervention. We need to move along, but I would like to squeeze a little question, one more question. Um, so, regarding, um, have you done late exams and compare one to the other one to see if you get the same data in a patient? Or and another question in the same setting is, can you predict uh, formation, thrombus formation? Uh, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Thank you for, uh, for squeezing those in. So for the uh, first, uh, I'll answer the second question first because that one is uh, more uh, a kind of a recent development in our lab. We can predict uh, thrombus development within the graft uh, and also uh, renal stent occlusion. And that actually will be presenting at the upcoming VRIP conference at the VAM this year. Um, as, as a lot of people who do these procedures know, there's about a 10 or 20% risk of, of renal branch re-intervention. Um, so I think that's a, an important finding and, and kind of uh, is an extension of Dr. Boyd's work uh, in uh, predicting thrombus formation in, in ruptured triplase that she published in the JBS a couple of years ago. Um, and then, oh, sorry, the first question, remind me again. Uh, it was um, um, regarding if you have taken. Oh, yeah, yeah, pre and post op. So uh, exactly. we have not done uh, post, like, for, like, compared the immediate post operative to, let's say, a five year or 10 year follow up uh, to see if there are any flow changes related to the geometry, kind of as the aorta remodels, but certainly it's something that we can do um, um, later on in future studies. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate it. Uh, congratulations, and uh, I want to remind everybody that these are three papers uh, that we selected today um, that it will be published in JDS uh, Vascular Science.